Good morning to everyone that is joining us and hello to everyone that's watching the replay. Welcome to another one of our online webinars, this time all about the new guidance on spray foam insulation inspections. How does this help property professionals? I'm your host Andy Ferguson and joining me this morning is PCA's CEO Steve Hodgson. Good morning Steve. Good morning Andy, good morning everybody. We've had some... Uh We've had some technical problems this morning, probably mostly to do with my incompetence and lack of assistance, but um, but hopefully we're back on track now. Well, guys, as Steve just explained to you, we were having some technical problems, but we are just about to start the main presentation. Just for those that are joining us, if you do want to ask questions over the course of the presentation, I just want to point you over to the chat facility that if you're on a desktop, that will run either down the right or the left-hand side. All you simply need to do is use the post button, stick, stick in your question, and we will be able to see it. Similar, if you want to pose any questions via email, you can just simply email me at andy at property-care.org. That's andy um, at property-care.org. Equally, if you want to pose any questions socially as well, you can do just visit our um, social channels, Twitter, Facebook, or um, LinkedIn and use the native um, uh, native messaging tools. Just quickly, just before we start the presentation, sometimes at this time of the morning we do have some problems. Um, mostly it's down to just everyone jumping on the computer at nine o'clock. If you are having any issues at any point, um, simply most of the time it's just a case of refreshing your screen. Worst case scenario, uh, and you're really struggling to hear anything, we were, are recording this presentation. We will email it out to everyone that has registered over the next couple of days, so you will see the presentation. Equally as well, which I forgot, if you are watching the replay on this and you do have any questions, just simply email me again at andy at um, property-care.org. So we are slightly just running behind starting, but we are in a good place. Um, so, Steve. Just over a year ago, we were talking about spread foam insulation in roofs. Um, for my memory serves, that was looking initially at that implications and some key considerations and considerations that many of us expecting need to know. Um, I know there's a lot that's happened since then. Spread foam is still dividing opinion. But this March 2023 saw the publication of the new spread foam inspection protocol. I suppose, how, how has this guidance come about? How can it be applied? And how can it help all building professionals and surveyors out there make better and informed decisions when it comes to spread from domestic roofs? Over to yourself, Steve. Okay, well, to answer some of your questions, I don't know whether it can. Um, but but what, what I want to do today, if we can, is, is, is really work through and have a look at um, kind of where we are so far um, on the, on the polyurethane foam um, issue. And we're, we're really looking specifically at, um, at, at, at dampness issues. We're not necessarily looking at thermal performance and all the rest of it, but, but we're, we're looking at the issues um, associated and the, the, the thoughts around um, how they've developed around PU phone. Um, so that's me. Um, I'm the CEO of the Property Care Association. Um, and you, you've kind of seen variations of slides of that slide, I think, before. So let me, let me sort of at least cover what we're going to look at today. Um, some of it's going to be quite quick. Some of it we're going to spend a little bit more time looking at the detail of it. Um, but we're going to look at how we arrived at, at where we are. Um, we're going to look at um, the guidance in a little bit of detail. And then we're going to um, also just have a think very quickly about what remains to be done um, by industry, by by ourselves, and and potentially by by the surveying community, the wider surveying community, and perhaps also by consumers uh, to, to some degree as well. Um, and even though this is not necessarily a, a, a deep dive into the um, the physical properties of polyurethane foam, um, it is it is hopefully going to give somebody uh, some of you some further insights into 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 the work that's been done, um, the background for that work, and how we move it. So back in 2021, um, PCA published um, what could only be a, a described as a bit of a, a review and a ramp. Um, and uh, we, 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 we discussed some of the issues that we saw. That, that, that piece of work is still up and you can still read that if you want. It's incredibly out of date, very opinionated, 
Um, but what that sort of led to was um, Alan Millstone and myself um, having a conversation about, you know, there was a problem. Um, surveyors were bumping up against this product um, and uh, value, uh, the, 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 the mortgage lending and the equity release industry were, were taking a very dim view on it. You know, some of that was perhaps um, a lack of understanding and some of that was well-placed um, concern over the long-term effects of um, some PV phone and some installations. So uh, Alan and I thought we would um, sort of get our collective heads together and Alan then had the idea, and it was his idea, not mine, to draw in as many stakeholders as possible to, to, to consider the problems, um, evaluate the existing knowledge that was out there, um, explore the need for research. Um, and we believed that at that time that the, that the research and probably academic research was necessary. And then we'd, we'd try and develop some sort of guidance. Um, and you know we, we we identified the issues, and you've seen you've seen some of these things these slides before. Um, and what I would say is that again, this is not necessarily about the physical properties of polyurethane foam. The the, the, the webinar that we did about I don't know, probably nine months, almost a year ago now, contains most of that. That's still available, so please go back and have a look at that if you want to know more about again the physical properties of, of the foam and how it works and all the rest of it. This is very much about the guidance. Um, so the issues again they were all sort of listed out um, lack of information um uh, there was concerns that were not necessarily well um, vocalized or, or well well understood inconsistent with lending properties lack of accountability from installers um lack of a, a, a forthright communication between stakeholders uh, and the phone was you know there wasn't a scoring mechanism for, 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 for calculating the value of PU foam on EPCs. So even from a, an installer point of view, there were lots of lots of problems. Um, and yes, you know, the, the issue of, of, of the way that the phone was sold and presented in the marketplace at that current moment um, was, 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 was concerning. Um, and I have to say we'll, we'll return to this, but still is. Um, and the photograph that you can see of the, the, the sort of the half and half roof it is a perfect example of that. Um, and you know, if anybody that can spot the fact that that is a bitumous um, felt um, on the bottom right hand corner um, and a soft um, insulating foam on the top would know that that is absolutely in contradiction to the, um, to the installer's guidance. But yet that was taken from an advert um, less than a fortnight ago. So, so even, even in that sort of context, there's still um, a lack of reliability in respect to um, what we're being told by 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 the people that okay, some of the people that are selling this product. So um, the, the the initial group drew in lenders, the supply chain from the polyurethane foam industry, surveyors groups, um, heritage organisation. We had academics, journalists, um, and 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 uh, we had consumer organizations and consumer protection organizations as well in that. Um, that resulted in um, both the RPSA and the PCA putting out different pieces of guidance. Um, that's ours, ours is still available. Unfortunately, um, RPSA had to withdraw theirs um, and you know the, the, the history on that is well documented. Um, ours um, is, is still worth a read, absolutely. It talks about um, the product um, and how you can um, identify what it is and various other things and identify its risk factors, consider the survey process and all the rest of it. So it, it kind of um, set a marker. And again, uh, you, 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 can, you can still download, have a look at that document at your leisure. So, um, you know, all good then. Um, and I guess that the photograph on the right, which I'm going to use a couple of times today, um, proves that actually things weren't all right after the issue of that guidance. Um, homeowners were absolutely still struggling with, um, with mortgageability and loans. Um, surveyors were still incredibly cautious about the product and um, mostly quite rightly. Um, again, even though there had been some statements made, there wasn't very much to guide surveyors towards a, or lenders, towards a, um, a conclusion, a reliable, reliable conclusion. Um, and, you know, lenders, as a result, still um, continue to, to, to restrict lending where they find polyurethane foam. Um, and, and again, further concerns began to emerge about fire safety and um, toxicology and various other bits and pieces. Um, 
some of which are, are unfounded, I have to say, um, in, in real terms, but others aren't. Um, so there was kind of no mechanism for risk for assessing risk, um, particularly moisture risk. Um, and again, the, the, there was a, a realization, and this was not a new realization, that there really isn't a, a quality assurance scheme or a universal quality assurance scheme for for installers. So there was no unifying voice that said this is how you do it and this is how you avoid moisture risk. Um, though I have to say that that there is a scheme. Um, and but it, but it's certainly not um, applied uh, across the, the whole of the, the, the installer industry. So the next bit, um, we again, Alan and I were um, were asked if we would um, would attend a meeting in London um, where um, some of the issues were were laid out with um, the team at um, Department of Leveling Up um, and. Alan and I, the result of that meeting, uh, Alan and I agreed that we would um, revisit the working groups and we would do some more work. Um, and that work would hopefully culminate in, in a couple of things. Um, the, 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 the first thing that we wanted to, 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 to pull together was the, um, was the document that you know, we're reviewing today, which was a mechanism essentially for, for, for getting to um, a conclusion for, for those people with, with foam, um, so a, a risk assessment um, process or a surveying process that, that could potentially be applied um, to that. And the other thing that was important, I think, that we all in, agreed was, again, uh, the self-regulation of the industry and uh, the production of um, our systems that could assure quality, give, give consumer confidence. Now, what I would say is that PCA um, I, I, I've moved away from that. That's not our job. We're we're not involved in that in that in that piece. Um, that is for industry to put that together, um, and we'll we'll touch on that a little bit later on. So we got the old team together back uh, back together, um, and you know some of the same people from the same sorts of organisations, um, and a few extras as well. So I think we ended up on the wider working group. We ended up with something like 52, 54. Um, individuals from from from, all, from different organisations, um, so um, very good representation, um, very broad spectrum of views and opinions, um, and that formed the basis of a of a working group. Um, the first working group was again for the guidance on surveyors, which is today's review, and the other work stream was um, particularly made up or strongly made up of uh, of, of people from um, from industry that were looking at. Um, the, the product to, to deliver consumer confidence um, and again that's that's something that i believe and hope is is, is work in progress so this is a document that we produced um, now the, the 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 text is is kind of been put together in a way that um i i haven't necessarily done before i've actually done something slightly similar this is quite kind of unique in as much as um, what we agreed was that the, the, the text of the document would remain the same and everybody bought in and everybody signed up, everybody that, that kind of worked on it. And, you know, there were lots of meetings and lots of conversations and a bit of horse trading, but, but the, the, the text is strong. And all parties, including the, the, the supply chain, um, including the surveying organisations that include the RICS and RPSA, um, it, it, including all the stakeholders, agreed that the text was good. And so what we said was there won't be anybody that owns that text and all the stakeholders can reproduce that text in whatever format they like. As long as they don't change the words, they can put it into whatever documents and use it in whatever way. And this is the one that we produced. And, and uh, I know that um, the, the, the Insulation Manufacturers Association are probably about to go to press with their version. Ours were not universally adored because I used photographs that I'd taken, that I owned, that were typical of the, of the, of the inspections that, that I had undertaken. Um, that didn't necessarily fit with the requirements or, or the desires of, of certain, um, certain people and certain organisations. But what you get is our version with, uh, with, 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 with a true representation of the agreed text. Now, look, look, I, I, this is the only bit where I put a little mark in red. Um, I, it's important to note that this document considers risks associated with moisture. It, it doesn't really consider thermal performance. Um, and that's not necessarily the, 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 the natural home territory for the Property Care Association. We are about dampness and water and, and 
fungus and insects. Um, it's not that we don't have a great interest at the moment in issues associated with um, thermal performance, but this document does not does not really cover that element of 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 of, of polyurethane foam or any other type of um, retrofit and ins insulation materials that you want to find in roofs. However, th there are some elements that kind of swap over and there's some touch points and some shared elements. So let's let's kind of look at look at the document and forgive my um, forgive my kind of death by PowerPoint element at this time. Um, it's kind of unavoidable. I tried to put some photographs in to sort of break it up a bit, but the trouble is that when you're reviewing a document, you end up with a lot of words on the page. Um, I'm also pretty ham-fisted with a marker pen, but <laughs> so you'll have to excuse that bit as well. But but hopefully you'll follow this. So the, the part one, general observations, actually really straightforward. There's nothing here that, um, that, that the average surveyor um, can couldn't do. Um, the, 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 the things that I've picked out and sort of highlighted are the things that are kind of particularly kind of not important but, but noteworthy perhaps. So the conditions of roof flashings, flaunchings and other things such as that are particularly important. Um, limited access and all that kind of stuff is, is kind of straightforward. And, and an internal evidence of roof defects. Um, now, this is particularly important because when you've got hard cell foam and you've got water coming through it, then actually these are precursors to decay. Um, and so actually, you know, if you can see any evidence of, of, of water ingress when you've got hard foams, that's a particular red flag because what you do know is that if you've got bonding foams, hard um, foams used um, as a stabilizing measure, and you've still got a roof leak, it's going to be very, very difficult to fix that roof with that material in place. And so it, it, those sorts of things should be triggering red flags and should be making you think about repairability, recoverability, and the implications, the further implications of those roof leaks when you've got foam layers. Now, the other reason, I've, I've, the, the last element, the moisture content of, of significant roof timbers, very important to establish that, particularly if you believe that there is an effect of the foam on the timbers, but be very, very wary of seasonal issues. And, and again, we'll pick that up as we work through the document as well. Um, it, it, is, it is very, very common to find um, elevated moisture contents in any timbers in roofs in the winter, particularly if it's very cold. Um, and so, so don't be too misled by that. You have to consider the, the, the seasonal elements, but but, but I would never <laughs> go and do an evaluation without thinking about the moisture contents and, and dismissing them um, out of hand. So these are further observations related to foam. Um, and these, 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 sorts of, um, these sorts of observations um, will allow the surveyor to provide justification for the recommendations that follow, of course. So it's important that these sorts of things are picked out. But again, um, these are these are these are relatively straightforward, but there are some bits of this that will require the surveyors to have um, some specific and and perhaps extended knowledge of, of of both products and their usage. So so some additional training probably is necessary in order to drive these these observations. So as something as simple as open or closed cell phone, um, that that's 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 not difficult to to, to grasp or, or or to pick up. Um, but then you've got to start thinking about underlays um, and, and sometimes understanding the nature of underlays and the characteristics of those underlays are quite difficult. This is where we first bring in the, the issue of um, not the issue, but, but, the, but the occasional presence of, 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 of spacer cards as well. So if, if, if you're not aware of this, um, some companies, and I think um, to their credit, um, it, 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 try and engineer in a, a gap between the felt, uh, the tiles and the insulation by inserting a card between the rafters and then spraying the insulation onto the card. This can only be relevant where you're using a, a soft insulated foam. It's not relevant when you're using a bonded foam, of course, because actually the point of the bonded foam is to glue the roof together and extend its life. But the fact is that these cards then allow a vapor gap uh, or, a, or an air gap, which allows vapor to be swept out behind that gap. Those, those cards are um, are vapor permeable um, in their nature, so you know they should improve the the, the, the resilience of the roof to, to moisture when the foam's in place. 
Um, so understanding the, the characteristics and understanding what you're looking at when you're looking at underlings um, can be quite can be quite difficult. Um, you know, it's it's it, it's it's there are lots of high performance underfelts, modern high performance underfelts. They have a massive range of vapor permeability characteristics, um, and and actually sometimes it's not even possible to know precisely what the vapor permeability characteristics of those products are unless you can find a product name. Um, and of course, the product name is obscured by the material. So um, the, the, there's some work to be done there to understand how that how that's to be done. And then you've got things like workmanship issues and the uniformity of the foam. Um, and, you know, has it been applied to everything? The, all of the depths of foams, those things can all be important. Um, and then the, 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 the final bullet on there is examine the sprayed foam and to ensure it's well bonded that um, you recall cracks and cracks and inconsistencies again um, partly because they are routes for vapor movement um, partly because they also compromise the thermal performance of the of, of the material again i'm not necessarily going to major on the thermal performance today um, so, so so you can see probably that there's some ele elements of orientation and, and training required around some of those things um, void ventilation um, this is this is kind of um, important, and, and 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 from the conversations I've had with with some surveyors, well understood in some areas, but not so well understood in others. Um, where you have a, a, a where you find a hard foam material in the roof, um, the, the void should typically be, be be a ventilated space, because that insulation that that uh, foam material was probably never designed as an insulator. It was a bonding agent to extend the life of the roof. Um, it also is very restrictive to the to, to, to the transfer of, of vapor because it's it's got a, a much much higher mu value, and so it's vapor vapor resistant, and so you still need to sweep the moisture out of that roof space um, with with ventilation. When you have soft cell foam, of course, it, it's acting as its primary function is to insulate the building and to to act as a, a, a mechanism for improving the thermal performance of the overall structure. If you ventilate behind it, it negates that value. So, so with soft cell phones, you shouldn't have that. You should, you should be a, a, a sealed unit um, and the phone should have been used pretty much to, to prevent um, air ingress through drafts. Then you've got to start thinking about um, the, the kind of what's on, happening at the ceiling level, because um, in most of the, if not all of the product approval certificates for, 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 for insulating polyurethane foam, um, there is a requirement to, to remove the, the insulation at ceiling level or there shouldn't be insulation at ceiling level. And if there is, um, and there's discussions about what hybrid roofs are where you have insulation in both elements. But the, but, but the basic principle is if you're cooling, if, if you're using the insulation and you've still got vapor drive at ceiling level, then, then actually the air that goes into the roof space is much colder. It's therefore probably got a higher RH. And then with the insulation that you've got above that, then the, the, the foam insulation, the vapor can quite easily reach dew point within it. And so you're into increasing um, the, the, the chances of interstitial condensation. So you've got, to, you've got to understand what's happening at ceiling level as well as what's having, happening at the pitch level. So um, again, there's, there's, there's some thoughts about hybrid, hybrid roofs and all the rest of it, but as a basic principle, a load of insulation at ceiling level is problematic. Vapor control layers, whoever checks if there's a VCL um, between um, the ceiling, the, the first floor ceiling and the, and the roof void, kind of nobody does. But where you've got these materials, it could be quite important. If there is a VCL, actually a lot of your problems go away, but there's, there's, there's hardly ever one there, let's be honest. And the other thing that's worth picking up here um, is, 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 and there's only one line about occupation in the whole document. Um, the vapor loadings inside the room are massively affected or totally dependent on what's happening in the occupied space below. And so actually understanding whether and how the occupied space below is ventilated and um, is kept, is, is, is kept the, the air moisture management is, is, is maintained can be very significant when you're thinking about um, how that vapor can possibly get into the roof and then cause a problem later. So occupation is 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 important, and the the, the, the management of air in the occupied space. Um, again, we've gone to part two. Knowledge, the bit everybody should know. Uh, 
<laughs> but then it says the surveyor should strongly be advised to read widely on the topic. Um, well, if you're giving comment on any product or any construction system or any element of the fabric of the building, of course, you should be well read on it. Um, and then there are some elements here where some basic CPD probably would be useful. Most of the people, I guess, on this webinar probably understand some of these things anyway. Um, we should understand some of these things. Differences between the foams, um, understand how the normal mechanics um, of water ingress and water failure, um, understand baking essence from water vapor transfer. All of those things are, are basically the background knowledge that everybody should have if they're thinking about um, understanding condition and understanding risk of, of moisture. So none of that is too is too is too onerous. Where we do get onto um, some stuff that perhaps is more onerous for um, for the normal residential um, sort of surveyor doing level two inspections uh, are, are some of this stuff. Um, and it says to carry out further inspections, the property professional should be able to demonstrate learning in the following. Um, knowledge and knowledge and evaluate the vapor performance characteristics of various types of sarking. That is, that's actually quite difficult. Um, and only because there are so many um, underfelts and sarkings out there in the world that have been used over the years. Some appropriately, some inappropriately, some are very old and some are um, very new. And so there's, there's quite a lot of work for, for, for people to do to understand the characteristics of those, of those wide range of materials. Um, be familiar with, it says, be familiar with BS 5250-2021. BS 5250 is a, is, is, a, is a monstrous document and quite difficult to read um, in as much as it covers everything to do with moisture in buildings. It's particularly focused, I would say, um, on, on new build, but actually totally as relevant to existing buildings. Um, it's a very expensive document to buy. Um, I don't necessarily think that the average surveyor should invest in 5250 and read it from cover to cover. Um, but, but actually, there is, a, there is a requirement, I believe, to understand the, the principles um, and the risk evaluations that, that are in 5250. And that's something, again, I'll, I'll come on to in a bit. Um, of course, people should be able to undertake invasive, non-invasive investigations to roof timbers and understand moisture content and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think that kind of goes without saying. Um, the one thing that most people kind of think they can do, but they may not be totally equipped to do, is be able to identify poor installation and workmanship. Um, th there are nuances even, even now that I'm learning that sort of indicate um, over dense materials or under dense materials or, or a lack of consistency during the application and these are kind of tricks of the trade and things that you know if you're doing it but actually that 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 they are now being sort of learned by by us as in a more academic way um from industry but 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 just understanding the 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 errors and problems that can occur during the application process are something that actually, you know, are evidenced when you look at uh, look at some phones that, that have problems, but actually wouldn't be necessarily immediate to, to, to a novice. So there's there's elements there that we have to pick up. Now the assumptions element. Um, th this was this was um, kind of down to and, and thanks go to um, all the people that were on it, but um, Jeff Hunt um, actually sort of said that, there, that we should have a, a section in the document that, that talks about assumptions. Um, and this is apparently something that's very familiar to, 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 to charter surveyors when you're looking at RICS guidance, for example, there are things that you should be able to just assume and would be reasonable for you to assume. And so I'm not gonna go through those, that's very much the territory of, of, of you guys, but I think that they're practical, they're pragmatic, they're straightforward and, and, and mostly pretty straight, straightforward to understand. My, my own, my own view, and I put it in my kind of little note on the left hand side, is is, is I kind of hate making assumptions on site. And it, it, it goes against sort of my um, sort of background and upbringing, looking at buildings. Um, you know, it, 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 when you're looking particularly at, at, at damp defects and modes of failure, uh, assumptions have, have caught better men than me out. So I, I I, I absolutely understand that these sorts of assumptions have to be made because you can't do everything all the time. But for me, good investigations and diagnostics do not necessarily rely on lots of assumptions. 
So this is this is the next section's part four. We're looking at um, the evidence that can be gathered and how the evidence should be gathered. Um, and again, that's all pretty straightforward enough. Um, the, 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 the reason that I've kind of put a bit of yellow on that bit about evidence sort might include um, rain penetration dates very straightforward. Poor worm machine materials, we talked about that as being some of those um, things known to industry that we're having to learn and then we'll share. Um, but the other thing is that the evidence of seasonal factors um, presented at the time of inspection might affect might affect the reasons conclusions. Be very, very, very careful when you're looking at roofs in the winter. Roofs in winter go into condensation regularly, and and, and and all the indications that we've that we've looked at where we're logging roofs that are in all sorts of conditions, it's not uncommon for, for roof timbers to get wet for short periods of time and then dry out perfectly adequately. The thing that we have to be concerned is, is where, they, is where they, they're allowed to get wet and then they have no mechanism to dry out effectively. Um, and foams, of course, uh, are potentially um, coverings that, that resist um, and, and reduce the, the, the rate of drying and evaporation. And, and in some circumstances can tip the balance between timbers being able to get wet and dry out and timbers that get wet and stay damp enough to, to, to manifest decay and accelerate accelerate problems. And that's at the heart of what we're doing. But but we have to think carefully about that season factor. Now, the, 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 there's photographs that are kind of pinging up. That's that's a photograph, top right hand corner. That, that that was a roof that we looked at in February, and that's mouse damage. That's mouse mouse smears on the on, on the phone. Um, and we'll we'll show you some more pictures of, of kind of rain and stuff in a minute. Now this part four handover pack, um, all of the um, all of the manufacturers um, that are um, you know running this out and being serious with polyurethane foam for the future are all absolutely um, telling us that they're committed to ensuring that a full um, handover pack accompanies every installation, and that handover pack has some things in it, um, or some requirements in it. Um, so that's evidence of a hydrothermal evaluation, condition of the roof pre-installation. Um, the vapor permeable permeability characteristics of any underlays um, of the underlay because um, soft shell foam should always be applied to something and not directly to the to the roof coverings ever ever if it is it's problematic it's big problems um, so the, the 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 fact is that um, in a in an ideal installation um, you should be presented or should be able to access a comprehensive handover pack that has all these things in place that concludes that actually the work that's going to be undertaken or has been undertaken should not increase the, 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 the likely risk of, of, of moisture related defects. Um, our own experience, our practical experience is that we're not looking at jobs that were done last week, but we're jo looking at jobs that were done even just two or three years ago. And those handover packs are just not comprehensive. They're not there. And we've even had incidences um, very recently where um, there has been some information left on site and unfortunately when we looked into the roof um, the, the the handover fact did not reflect the, the underlying construction of the roof timbers. So yes, the handover pack is really important and that shows an element of due diligence, but you still you still probably um, will be well advised to check that the facts set out in that pack are, are correct. The one thing, of course, that, that, that keeps coming up is, you know, what has the phone been applied to? Um, I, again, the last one that I looked at where there was a problem, it said that there was a breather felt underneath it. Um, we actually scratched a hole in the um, in, in, in the foam and found that there wasn't any, any underlay at all. Um, so you have to not allow these things to, to kind of go un, un, unverified, if you like. Um, Further investigations, we talked about this, but you know, the bit I've kind of run a little ring, a ring around is, um, it, it, it is important in my view to determine the presence of vapor control layers, ceiling and, and actually understand where you've got completeness and all that kind of stuff, um, because, because they do affect the vapor uh, and the, the, the water risk in the building. Um, yes, lots of photographs, all that kind of stuff. Um, the 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 issue around the kind of the further investigation bit is that and we'll come on to the flow charts in a second is that um there is here 
Um, and I'll, I'll, in fact, I'll change the slide and we'll look at it. We'll look at it in a second. So the conclusions we have we have we have three real conclusions, only really three conclusions that the, the, the guidance recommends that you can draw. That the the risk of um, the recent de defect, defects of the property are not significantly increased by the presence of spray foam, um, and that's a perfectly legitimate um, and and will be hopefully as we move forward uh, a relatively common um, conclusion to draw. But then you have two others. The risk of defects to the property are probably increased and um, that you would probably need a further investigation to understand how significant that is. However, sometimes you'll also say that uh, the, 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 the risk of defects is, is, is greatly increased and you won't need to go and revert to somebody else because there's a puddle of water or you can find some rotten timbers. So you've got, you've got no action needed or some action needed and the third element, of course, is that you don't have enough information to draw a conclusion either way and you need some help. Now, the, 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 the one place that this whole thing falls down currently, um, and we'll come on to this in a, in a moment or two, is that we don't have a well of those trained specialists that are capable or willing to take the liability for the evaluation of these um, installs when you don't have a complete and, um, and comprehensive and undisputable um, installation pack and lots of great access. So, you know, it, it, it means almost inevitably that you'll be pointing this or you be, at some point, some people will be looking to point this towards um, towards specialists. Um, the specialists don't exist just yet. Um, and, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll try and figure out a way of fixing that. So before we kind of move on a any further, and we're kind of getting towards the end of this, and certainly through the document, we'll look at the, the, the flow charts. So we've been kind of careful, and you know, the, the sharp-eyed amongst you will see that this is not, these two flow charts aren't differentiated by the type of foam. They're differentiated by um, coverings where underlay is present and no underlay is present. So that would have cover pretty much all hard foams, because the hard foams that the, the, the um, closed cell foams, as most people describe it, um, were only well, predominantly used in roofs as, as a stabilizing measure. So to try and increase the useful life of the roof. Um, but they will always, um, by definition, if that's the case, be applied directly to primary, primary roof materials. But actually the risk phases um, with soft foam applied directly to the primary roof coverings um, are, are also the same. So this flow chart kind of works you down um, to, 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 to give you sort of very limited options, really. It says recommend a re-roof, remove the PU foam if you can, or advise that um, reactive repairs are no longer possible and the roof replacement for the foam removal should be scheduled in the future. Now, the one thing that you should be kind of aware of is that when you've got these materials applied directly to the primary roof coverings, repairing the roof is made incredibly difficult and you know repairing the roof in a way that gives you continuity is very difficult and once you have to start repairing the roof where foam is present it just is a nightmare so really i'm not saying that you should rush to recommend roof repair roof renewals but actually it, where where there isn't any obvious problems or there aren't any deteriorations but actually it is probably um inevitable that you're going to be advising clients that they should schedule it, they should think about it, they shouldn't rely on it forever, um, that they should take a practical and pragmatic approach to doing this. Having said that, in some circumstances where you find active rot, where you find deterioration, where you find roof leaks, where you find very high moisture levels that aren't going to, um, aren't going to correct themselves early in the spring when the, when the sun hits the roof, then, then actually um, much more affirmative action than passive is, 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 is probably, um, probably required. Now this is a far more complicated, um, or looks like a far more complicated flow chart, but actually kind of work it through and you know use your finger and work through the flow charts is not actually that difficult. Um, this is this is basically all foams where they've been applied to a felt, um, and 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 actually you work through it. It gives you four options: um, low risk, no action. Remove the foam, remove the quilt across the ceiling to reduce the chances of interstitial condensation in the materials above. Or you recommend a re-roof. 
Um, and so actually that's all fine. The, the, the kind of a, the thing that's in the middle of that flow chart, however, that we haven't answered yet, and that there isn't an answer for, is um, survey the roof by a specialist. Um, we need a work, we need a, a useful bank of specialists um, to pick up that function um, if the, the, the chart surveying world doesn't have an appetite for it. Um, and that's that, that's something we'll, we'll we'll discuss in a few seconds. Right, just to, 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 to um, I'm conscious that we're kind of pushing time a little bit. And I do want to leave some quite time for questions, but but a few other things that I have seen um, spotted. These are all my photographs from sites I've visited quite recently. Things that we also should be aware of. Um, it, it would appear that um, so apart from the middle photograph, which I've taken from somebody else, um, which is great, got bird's nest inside the foam. Um, but, but it does appear that the foam in certain circumstances can produce a, a very good harborage for, 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 for unwanted um, guests. So, you know, quite recently I found a couple where rats have made, um, made use of the foam as both harborage um, and as a mechanism for, for moving about. Um, the bottom left is, is smears from, from mice. Um, the mice have been eating the foam or, or at least um, using the foam for, for something because there's foam all over the floor. Um, birds are nesting in it. Um, we also found bats um, in, in at least two properties that I visited um, recently. Now that, that raises all sorts of other problems and issues because those bats would certainly have been there before the PU foam was applied. Um, and now, you know, that certainly laws were broken um, if, if the PU foam was, was installed without, um, without having consent from a bat officer and without all the relevant bits and pieces having been done. That, that throws up a whole bunch of other issues um, that not, we're not necessarily going to beat ourselves up about today. But um, again, you know, I, I don't quite understand how we've got to a point where we're applying polyurethane foam to, to bat roosts. Um, on a on a you know even two two in a fortnight was a bit was a bit scary um i said we wouldn't necessarily um bark on too much about thermal capacity um but but it is worth actually kind of considering just for a second surveyors aren't necessarily being asked unless you're you know involved with epcs and that sort of stuff to look at thermal performance of structures but actually, if 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 this material is being used and relied on, or is being um, considered to be thermally important, then actually it's got to it's got to do a, do what it's supposed what it was designed to do. And we've seen lots of installations where foam has been installed in a way that doesn't actually deliver the thermal performance that you know anybody would necessarily expect from it. Lack of continuity, um, lack of depth, holes in it, problems with it. So um, that that's probably something for another day, but 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 we have to we have to consider that too. Um, talked about ventilation. Um, the, the 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 job on the left hand side was a, a hard cell foam. The hard cell foam had been used in a way that totally negated the ventilation in the roof space. Um, that caused um, that that probably caused problems, um, though the building was in in a poor state anyway. Um, but certainly that roof had to be completely re-roofed, new rafters, new, um, actually new purlins as well. But the fact is that that foam, it's a hard cell foam directly onto the back of slate, um, that had removed any natural ventilation into the roof um, and, and, and there were problems inside the occupied space and problems inside the roof. And the other side of the ventilation issue is, is this is a photograph that I know you've seen before. Um, uh, anybody that's watched these, these before, this is a, a positive ventilation system that's been in, in a roof and um, that relies on air infiltration being recycled back down into the occupied space to create um, a slightly elevated pressure and therefore diffuse the moist air in the rooms below. It can't possibly do that if there's no fresh air getting into the roof and uh, essentially the, 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 the spray foam installers have just simply ignored or not known the, the, the implications of, of that ventilation system. But it, it, it's, 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 it's utterly useless now, um, it cannot work. Um, and the other thing is that, you know, the condensation risk is, is, is something that, you know, this is all about really, but this is, a, this, this is a job I only looked at 
last Friday, and, and this was for a, for a friend and a colleague rather than anything commercial. Um, but but this shows, um, you know, 275 mil of insulation across the ceiling, um, hard cell foam um, applied directly onto the backside of concrete tiles. And what was happening here is that that actually what, what what's going on is there was wet patches appearing um, above the, the shot of the facade. And, and actually, when you get into it, you find that the insulation doesn't go to the eaves, but the spray foam insulation doesn't also doesn't right, get right down into the eaves. So you've got sections of utterly and completely un, un, unventilated, uh, uninsulated um, masonry um, down in the corner, and it's simply the water's condensing on it and dripping down onto the ceiling. Um, it's actually not a tough one to do, but you know, it's just a catalogue of errors. The, the foam, the foam is 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 utterly, utterly pointless in this job. It was installed 18 years ago. The roof was absolutely fine before it was before it was applied. It's still absolutely fine now. However, you know, the point is that that roof cannot be maintained and repaired. And at the point of sale, there's a high probability that it won't sell. It will have to be, it'll have to be re-roofed needlessly because of the, because of the presence of that, of that foam. So, yeah, it 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 it's it's it, it's annoying. I was in um I, I was in southern Spain a little while ago and, and I took that photograph. Um that's hard cell foam used to stabilize um a a a wall where a building has been taken down. Um I really like that use of foam. That got nothing to do with anything, but I just thought you might be interested. So what what happens next? Um We've kind of thought long and hard about this, um, and, and we've had some options uh, as to how we approach it with regards to training and orientation and all the rest of it. Um, I have rightly or wrongly come to the conclusion that I don't think that the UK will need thousands of specialists that know um, polyurethane foam and its characteristics inside out. I just don't think that that is required. Um, I don't even think we'll need hundreds. Um, I think that a lot of this can and will and should resolve itself and it all becomes normalized in time. Um, but I do think that there will be a need uh, and there is an interest for a, a relatively small number of people to get the information and the knowledge that they need to be able to act as specialists um, where that is required. So PCA are currently thinking about, um, slightly more than thinking about, but, but we will schedule some workshops um, probably in the summer, um, where we will inv invite um, members and a, a, a number of um, interested charter surveyors to come and join us. And we'll do some sort of semi-formal workshops. There'll be day-long workshops at our offices in Huntingdon, because I think they would work much better face-to-face, -face, where we can look at some, some, some samples and um, look at foam and, um, and discuss um, our own experiences. Um, and, and kind of romp through the whole subject um, in, in some detail over the space of five or six hours. Um, so we're going to try and run some of those this summer. Um, spaces will be limited. So if, if, if and when, um, I'm sorry, when the, the notifications for these events come up, um, we, you know, book early because we're not going to just put them into the calendar. We're not going to put this course into the calendar as a long name thing. We think it's probably a short duration sort of um, opportunity, if you like. So we're going to do that probably through the summer, carry on as long as there's an interest. Um, but yeah, I, I would say if you are interested, um, get involved, look for it, book it. Um, I can't see us doing this, you know, for years and years to come. I think that we'll fill the requirements of the market um, relatively quickly. If I'm proved wrong, then things might change. But um, I think that we're plan I'm planning currently to do about probably no more than three events initially um, through the summer and early autumn. Um, and then we'll see where we go from there. Um, but again, semi-formal things and ho hopefully they'll be quite enjoyable and quite interesting. Um, the one thing I will say is that there is a big gap um, still in, in stuff. We, 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 we are hoping, very much hoping, that, um, that, that the PU foam industry will kind of crack on um, and get to a point where there is some regimentation and regulation um, applied across the PU foam industry. 
Um, the adverts that you know I flagged up earlier are contemporaneous. They are within the last few days. Um, because I've shown an interest in this, I get bombarded on my social media feeds with in, with, with with adverts for, for for foams, and and most of them are showing installations that are not compliant with their own product in, product guides. Now that that speaks volumes to me. Um, and, 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 and so, you know, this problem is not going to go away for consumers or for surveyors or for the industry until that gets fixed. So, you know, this is on, on my soapbox, but I would implore you to get that sorted. Um, the more it's delayed, the more problems that will occur and the more frustration there will be in the marketplace. So, so please, please supply chain, let's get that done. Um, and a quick note to, um, to Teresa Salisbury, thank you very much for your photographs. I thought they were brilliant. I've nicked a couple, um, uh, but these, these, these were photographs that she took um, at a recent job. And yeah, you know, actually somebody's thought about thermal continuity, um, but they've also sprayed foam all over a chimney breast, which kind of makes you scratch your head a bit. Um, and then they've in, in, in buried a, a, a waste pipe. And this is the job where the bird's nest was. Um, so, you know, lots of things to see, lots of interesting stuff. So that's um, that's kind of me done. Um, I hope that that was a little bit of a romp through the document. It was a bit garbly. Um, I'm still a little bit all over the place. It was at the RPSA conference yesterday and spoke to lots of surveyors that were interested in the subject. Um, there are, I know there's lots of questions um, surveyors have about polyurethane foam still and how they should manage it. Um, and he said it, it divides opinion. My experience is that there isn't much division of opinion. Most surveyors don't like it, um, and they don't. They don't. They, they think even that PCA in, in in trying to give a balanced view on foam are, are, are probably on the wrong side of the argument. Well, I would say that we're not. Um, I would say that we're trying to be pragmatic and and, and, and sensible about it. Um, I think that just to give you one example of of where i think it's all gone too far is that i had um a couple on the phone only a few weeks ago that had a house that was only three years old and that incorporated polyurethane foam um inside the structure from new and a surveyor had refused to lend on it or a, so reported back to the back to the um, back to the lender and there was a zero valuation put on a on a house that was only three years old Polyurethane foam was probably a perfectly reasonable solution. It was protected by vapor check layers. It was absolutely fine and proportionate to that new build. And yet those vendors had hit a brick wall and were considering pulling the ceilings out of their new house to remove the foam. And that, that, that seems to me as though it's all got a bit disproportionate. Um, so, you know, again, um, it's not for me necessarily to comment too hard on that sort of stuff but i do think the approach that we're trying to take is one of um of one of sensible pragmatism um having said that would i have my mum's house installed with polyurethane foam as a house in the highlands that's 100 years old with no i wouldn't um, of course i wouldn't it's not appropriate to those sorts of installations but it doesn't mean that it doesn't have applications anyway andy i can't actually see notes or anything else so I'm going to hand over to you, and, and if you could read any questions out, then um, then I'll pick them up. No worries. We'll stay here. Firstly, hear me. Thanks for just sharing those insights. I hope hopefully everyone agrees. Great presentation, guys. I'm going to try and rattle through these as fast as possible because I know time is short for ourselves. I'm going to start off with a question um, that was emailed in to us from uh, Naya Kabar. Um, she's a chartered surveyor, and she's asking when she's inspecting a property. Is there an easy way for a surveyor to understand the difference between open and closed cell foams? I mean, is it is it a case like in the past, Steve, where you used to be able to take a screwdriver and poke it into the timbers? Is there is there is there is an easy let, way? Let, let me let, 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 let me answer that if I can. Um, it, if you go if you go and have a quick look at the original work that we did on this, um, that kind of gives you some insight. But actually, you know, it, it's it, it's about it's about the finger test. Here's a piece of closed cell foam. Yeah, you know, I make a little dent in it. If that was open cell foam and I poked it like that, my finger would go into it. Um, you know, it, it, it's a bit, it, it's a bit of a misnomer. A screwdriver will go into it because it's a nice pointy thing. 
but actually it's about it's about resistance and you can you can tell very quickly um actually what it is the other thing that if you look back at some of the photographs in this presentation you'll see that the, the hard cell foams generally do not fill the, the the gap in the rafter they're applied much more thinly as a as a bonding agent and you'll see that that, that you'll you have the rafter will still sound proud and the foam will follow the contour of the roof much more much more clearly whereas with soft foams you're trying to build up thickness in order to get the thermal performance and you'll probably find that um, even on a standard sort of four or five inch rafter that the, that the foam will be um, proud if not flush with those with those rafters so there's you know you, you can usually tell by looking but you mm. can certainly tell by poking <laughs> okay okay well moving on very quickly and steve i know time's against us but if you can be as quick as possible with some answers i've got an adrian Locke who's asking now this may be a wee bit controversial so pinch of salt sort of idea but from your experience would you be prepared to comment on what percentage of installations are have been okay and how many have potentially required removal so from the ones that you've actually seen how many have actually been okay okay that is that you asked me to ask this quickly yeah. um i can't the, okay. the, the, the fact yeah. is that how many are completely okay i i the, the, it, it's a it's an un, it, it's an my experience is always going to be slowed because we're not necessarily looking at buildings that i've either had it done five minutes ago or that are by definition concern free somebody's had a concern um so the older ones i think are absolutely problem really problematic um closed cell foams applied directly to tiles i think are, are really problematic you should never glue a roof together to extend its life from the inside in my view it's just a, from, it, it's a death thing so 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 all of those are problematic and and when you describe removal it's not quite as linear as all that either um so there, there will be a proportion that are fine i just don't get to see them I, so i don't know that, that 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 question as far as how many should have immediate action the ones that are failing and have a problem now should they be actioned now but uh, but i was asked um even yesterday you know if i find this foam should i should i should i respond by telling the owner by telling the purchaser that it should be removed no i don't think you should i think that absolutely we need to be more grown up about it and we look at need to look at ind individual properties and make the correct decision on scheduling action mm -hmm. sometimes no action will be needed some action may be maybe something that you can schedule for, for four five six seven years because actually there is no problem but there is still an underlying construction defect that probably needs picking up so it it's a really really good question and it's a really really bad answer but 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 there isn't it would be unfair and unwise to say because you see it you have to action it because there is an a, a, a something that is slightly wrong or that increases risk a bit that actually that requires draconian action at that point um it's a little bit like anything to do with dampness some things need immediate action to arrest further further deterioration others can be planned and programmed and should be planned and programmed and and sprayed foam and e issues with sprayed foam sh shouldn't be considered to be any different to anything else no worries. Well, here, folks, just like no, we are slightly running over by, by a couple of minutes, but we are going to try and ram in as many questions as possible. So, Steve, just on the flip side of that question, interestingly, Neil Hallett is, has actually asked, is there actually a spray foam system you have found to work effectively and could recommend to keep in place? No, it's not. no okay that's an easy one for me to answer it's a good question um i don't recommend any products um and that's that that's not something that i would and could do I, I, you know my my interest is how these things fail um and you know what's what what, what makes me a, a pretty sick old bunny really is the fact that it wouldn't matter whether you were asking me about timber plastic fiberboard or um or polyurethane sprayed foam I could probably still tell you the, 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 the modes of failure if they're not applied and used correctly. Um, what I would say is that 
I believe that there are applications probably for this material in new build and in industrial and commercial situations that probably make it a, a really good choice. I think retrospectively in domestic properties, particularly in roof voids, I think that irrespective of moisture risk, the practicality of use is something that, that, that they may well be niche uses for. But actually, if you can insulate the, the ceiling with 275 millimeters of rock wall, then that will give you a much better thermal performance because you're not having to heat that whole roof void to get the benefit out of sprayed foam against the rafters. So, so there are there are there are not just material characteristics, but there are application characteristics that mean um, that that actually for me, PU foam sprayed against the rafters wouldn't be my wouldn't probably be my first go to, um, can I ever? Um, but again, I, I'm speaking slightly out of turn now because my issue here is is moisture risk, and and yeah, um, we're talking about existing domestic roofs, um, and and I find the product interesting and probably useful with conversions and trying to create rooms in roofs. But but again, it's about doing it correctly, and it's about actually following the instructions and following the guidance that's written out in the product approvals um, to the letter. All right, well, last question I'm going to ask you, it's a more of a kind of two point question, comes from Stephen Lees. Um, he's asking, will PI cover roof void inspections and inspections for mortgage valuations? Also, he's asking as well, is there actually a list of experts out there that people and chartered surveyors can refer to? Okay. So the first one, I don't know. Um, yeah. I have a clue whether you, whether your PI is going to cover anything, um, and so you have to go to ask your PI supplier on that one. Um, uh, not a clue. On the second, is there a list of experts? No, there isn't. Um, I, I could probably count the people that I would suggest are experts, uh, and that I know um, that are independent of manufacturers or not in this building or or are out there in, in private practice providing um, evaluations on the fingers of one hand and I'd probably still have a spare thumb. Um, they're, they're, not, they're not there at the moment. Um, and this is, this is definitely emerging knowledge um, and the consolidation of this knowledge is certainly something that is ongoing. Um, and so the answer to that is no, there isn't on that score as well, I'm afraid. Well, folks here, I apologize if we've not been able to squeeze in your question. But um, just very conscious of time, just in case those that are, that there is people in here looking for additional information, I just want to point you to a couple of resources that you'll be able to get. Firstly, I've just shared out just right now the actual document itself. It should be popping up in everyone's screen that you can actually download. But if it's not, you can go to that link right at the very top of the screen just at the moment in time. That will take you to our spray foam insulation page. Where you'll be able to find the document but also other things regarding observations guidance and recommendations plus as well the previous webinar that steve mentioned you can as well go into a technical library for other stuff but also as well uh, as i mentioned there is a cpd video library there with the previous free phone webinar but also other dampness etc related webinars last but not least the replay of today's webinar will be available in the next couple of days um, you heard Steve mention about the masterclass earlier on that we're hoping to run in the summer that will have a limited amount of people that we'll be able to offer it to. But there are some other training courses, semi-related, that might be of interest to you. That I'm very quickly, that's a retrofit insulation masterclass on understanding and managing moisture risk in building and a severe and dampness in building flagship courses. Um, very quickly and just before I kind of just finish off because I again very conscious of time our next webinar is now up on the website this time we are switching to the invasive weed side of things it's a bit earlier than normal we are taking it between invasive species week between the 15th and the 21st of May it's titled the invasive invasive invasion are our homes been overtaken and it's all based off the recent statistics showing 50% of plants in Britain are now non-native. How has their introduction to our homes and gardens impacted the spread and sometimes the potential risk to our buildings? If you are interested, there's links into the chat that you can go to. 
Uh, last but not least, I just want to say a big thank you to yourself, Steve, for um, sharing your knowledge and insight. And also to everyone that joined us this morning. Hopefully you enjoyed what you heard and hopefully we see you on another future broadcast. Thanks everyone and have a lovely rest of the morning. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye.